of the Red-Headed League. You see, Watson, he explained in the early hours of the morning as we sat over a glass of whiskey and soda in Baker Street, it was perfectly obvious from the first that the only possible object of this rather fantastic business of the advertisement of the League and the copying of the encyclopedia must be to get this not over bright pawnbroker out of the way for a number of hours every day. It was a curious way of managing it, but really it would be difficult to suggest it better. The method was no doubt suggested to Clay's ingenious mind by the colour of his accomplice's hair. The four pounds a week was a lure which must draw him, and what was it to them who were playing for thousands? They put in the advertisement, one rogue has the temporary office, the other rogue incites the man to apply for it, and together they managed to secure his absence every morning in the week. From the time that I heard of the assistant having come for half wages, it was obvious to me that he had some strong motive for securing the situation. But how could you guess what the motive was? Had there been women in the house, I should have suspected a mere vulgar intrigue. That, however, was out of the question. The man's business was a small one, and there was nothing in his house which could account for such elaborate preparations and such an expenditure as they were at. It must then be something out of the house. What could it be? I thought of the assistant's fondness for photography and his trick of vanishing into the cellar. The cellar. There was the end of this tangled clue. Then I made inquiries as to this mysterious assistant and found that I had to deal with one of the coolest and most daring criminals in London. He was doing something in the cellar, something which took many hours a day for months on end. What could it be once more? I could think of nothing save that he was running a tunnel to some other building. So far, I had got when we went to visit the scene of action. I surprised you by beating upon the pavement with my stick. I was ascertaining whether the cellar stretched out in front or behind. It was not in front. Then I rang the bell, and as I hoped, the assistant answered it. We have had some skirmishes, but we had never set eyes upon each other before. I hardly looked at his face. His knees were what I wished to see. You must yourself have remarked how worn, wrinkled, and stained they were. They spoke of those hours of burrowing. The only remaining point was what they were burrowing for. I walked round the corner and saw that the city and suburban bank abutted on our friend's premises and felt that I had solved my problem. When you drove home after the concert, I called upon Scotland Yard and upon the chairman of the bank directors, with the result that you have seen. And how could you tell that they would make their attempt tonight? I asked. Well, when they closed their league offices, that was a sign that they cared no longer about Mr. Jabez Wilson's presence. In other words, that they had completed their town. But it was essential that they should use it soon, as it might be discovered, or the bullion might be removed. Saturday would suit them better than any other day, as it would give them two days for their escape. For all these reasons, I expected them to come tonight. You've reasoned it out beautifully, I exclaimed, in unfeigned admiration. It is so long a chain, and yet every link rings true. It saved me from ennui, Boredom. he answered, yawning. Alas, I already feel it closing in upon me. My life is spent in one long effort to escape from the commonplaces of existence. These little problems help me to do so. And you are a benefactor of the race, said I. He shrugged his shoulders. Well, perhaps after all it is of some little use, he remarked. L'homme c'est rien, l'oeuvre c'est tout, as Gustave Flaubert wrote to George Sand. That is to say, the work is everything. Again, the story follows a pattern not unusual in any of the Arthur Conan Doyle stories about Sherlock Holmes. Again, at level one, let's finish it now. We have the last part of the story. The solving of the crime, the explanation of how it is that Sherlock Holmes could know. Watson is always kind of blown away by the ways in which Sherlock Holmes is able to put it together. Let's point out how clearly easy it is for you, the reader, to have figured it out after the fact. 
as was said earlier in the story, it's always the calm and the little things that kind of give everything away. Let's jump to 2A really quickly. Some messages, some themes here. One is one that we just said. That is to say, the simple, the most obvious, is sometimes the more interesting stuff in life. Not the complicated stuff. And yet, that's the stuff that we most often don't pay much attention to at all, right? Another major possible message here is the celebration of a great mind, namely Sherlock Holmes. He embodies the hero in many ways. Now, this is a different kind of hero. He's a hero unlike Odysseus. He's more of a hero that loves to kind of challenge his mind. And, of course, he says it, when I'm not being challenged... Ennui, the French word means boredom, um, the idea that oh, there's nothing left to do. Holmes loves, he lives for these kinds of opportunities. Of course, it to be our protagonist is clearly Sherlock Holmes, our antagonist is obviously Clyde, and we're able to kind of follow to the very end of the story the way that Sherlock Holmes was able to do the investigation, find the clues, explain the clues, and then ultimately catch the bad guy. Of course, at 3A, all of a sudden, you can probably write down a text or two that comes to mind for you that plays a very similar kind of game. There are all kinds of really famous types of stories that are like going to pattern themselves after this. And probably you've seen a movie or two that plays the games with Sherlock Holmes as well. By the way, we can go ahead and put there as well the Odyssey. There, there is a quest here, and we have a hero in, uh, going on a quest, but a different kind of quest, we might say. What is it that Odysseus and Sherlock Holmes have in common? Their wit. Remember, we talked about Odysseus being called the wily Odysseus, the sly, the, 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 the quick-witted Odysseus. Holmes will play a very similar kind of game. Finally, of course, we'll ask the 3B question. What, what do you think about this, this hero, this investigative hero, this character? Do you like this kind of a story? And if so, why? Do you like mystery stories? Some will call them murder mystery stories, the famous Agatha Christie murder she wrote kinds of stories, right? They, those notions of trying to solve, the, solve the, 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 the crime or whatever, and then at the very end to go, oh, yeah, yeah. What is for you your favorite text like this? And do you, do you consider yourself observant, right? And remember early on that Holmes was able to find out things about Wilson, like, oh, I can tell you're from China by virtue of that tattoo that you have there on your wrist. Are you an observant person or are you not very observant? When was a time in your life when you used your observations to try and solve a potential problem? When, was, when did that happen for you? Well, there you go. An introduction to Sherlock Holmes, Arthur Conan Doyle. I hope maybe you'll find other stories of his, like Hound of the Baskervilles, which is a really fun read as well. Thank you.